All right, welcome everyone. Uh, welcome to Co Cooperism 1313. I'm hoping that that term will soon roll off the tongue more easily. Um, so this evening, we're launching uh, our ninth edition of the 1313 public seminar series here at Columbia Center for Contemporary Critical Thought. Uh, and I'm glad you can all join us. We're thrilled uh, that you're here. We invite you to participate in all of the seminars in person when we're here in New York City or by Zoom or live stream when you're out of town or we're out of town. And the live streams are always on the homepage and the landing page for the session of cooperation, the cooperation 1313. And they're on, right? They're on. Okay, great. Might use the mic more. Okay, all right, sure. So our project this year uh, is to explore forms of cooperation in society. Our animating questions this year are, what are the most promising forms of cooperation that can be harnessed to build a more sustainable, equal, and just society? What can we learn from existing forms of cooperation, such as worker cooperatives, mutual aid, revolutionary movements, temporary autonomous zones, producer and consumer co-ops, mutuals, and solidarity networks in order to create robust networks of cooperation? How can we combine, leverage, uh, concentrate, and compound existing experiments in cooperation in order to con construct a sustainable ecological, political, economic, and social environment? And would it be possible to imagine a robust regime of cooperism that would eclipse current forms of neoliberal capitalism. Now, uh, by investigating the most promising forms of cooperation, we hope to imagine an entire political, economic, social, and legal regime um, that really could, could displace existing forms uh, of extractive capitalism. So, in some, this year, uh, the plan is to try and figure out what a world of cooperism would look like, okay? Now, because of the urgency of the situation in Atlanta right now, uh, with the movement to defend the Atlanta forest, stop Cop City, we're gonna start there tonight uh, at Cooperism 113. And we're gonna explore the question, how do people come together, join forces, work together towards a common objective and achieve solidarity and collectivity in temporary autonomous zones, TAZs, like the Atlanta Forest or the ZAD, the Zone à Défendre at Notre Dame des Landes? Of course, it takes a massive amount of cooperation with a shared objective and an extraordinary amount of solidarity to mount a temporary autonomous zone. We've seen over the past few decades a growing number of such occupations intended to block neoliberal, prison industrial, and other infrastructural project. Uh, we've studied many of them in the previous 1313 seminars. Standing Rock, you'll recall, Occupy Wall Street in Zuccotti Park. Uh, we've already even discussed some, to some extent, the ZAD at Notre Dame des Landes. All of these political projects require a massive amount of cooperation. Uh, and that's what's going on today with the forest defenders in Atlanta uh, at uh, Stop Cop City, opposing the destruction of the Wheelany Forest and the construction of an 85 acre, $90 million police training facility there. It's also happening in Turkey as we speak now, where activists have been resisting a plan to clear cut the Akbelin Forest in southwestern Turkey to make room for government-sponsored expansion of coal mines in the region. How does cooperation work in these settings? How do people manage to work together towards a common objective and to achieve that kind of solidarity? Now, to discuss all this, we're going to be hearing tonight from uh, three extraordinary uh, practitioners, thinkers, critical thinkers, uh, lawyers, and um, just terrific um, organizers. Um, we're gonna hear from Kamau Franklin, uh, who is a dedicated community organizer and attorney who's been deeply involved in organizing in Atlanta, uh, on Stop Cop, Stop Cop City and other issues. He's the founder of Community Movement Builders, 
in Atlanta. You've probably been reading a lot of his comments recently uh, about the indictment, which I'll talk about in a minute. He's an attorney. Uh, he served at the bar here in New York City uh, for, uh, for 10 years, uh, criminal law, civil rights practice as well. And before founding the Community Movement Builders, Kamau was a leading member of a national grassroots organization dedicated to the ideas of self-determination and the teachings of Malcolm X. Then we'll hear from Tiffany William Roberts. Welcome, Tiffany. Uh, Director of the Public Policy Unit at the Southern Center for Human Rights in Atlanta. Uh, Tiffany has practiced uh, criminal defense work as well, uh, was practicing uh, since 2008, starting as a public defender. And then she expanded her private practice to include civil rights litigation for victims of police abuse. She's a community organizer, uh, now in charge of policy thinking at the, at the Southern Center. She co-founded the police accountability organization called Building Locally to Organize for Community Safety Blocks. That was in 2008, and that was to promote a holistic approach to public safety. She's now spearheading legal defense uh, coordination for protesters uh, through a new program that she's put together called the Bridge Project, which she's going to talk about some. There's some information about it on the web already. Um, and uh, they're going to be deeply involved in part with the defense uh, organizing and helping with the defense of the forest defenders in Atlanta. And then we're going to put these efforts in Georgia in conversation with the decade-long efforts at Notre Dame des Landes. And we're going to turn to Andre Pretman, a brilliant young scholar here at Columbia, who is studying these forms of cooperation through literary texts with a specific focus on the ZAD at Notre Dame des Landes and other um, movements like that. Andre uh, is completing a, a really brilliant dissertation uh, on French authors who write about precarity and political organization um, in conversation with the writings of the Invisible Committee uh, and other radical critical theories. Now, uh, you've certainly heard about all of the police repression and crackdown in Atlanta and also at the ZAD and actually at every other site uh, that we were thinking about at, at Occupy Wall Street, at Standing Rock. Um, those, those movements are always shut down by police violence. And just yesterday, you saw the, uh, the amount of repression that is being meted on, the, uh, on some of the organized, some of the people who have been involved uh, in Stop Cop City. Uh, yesterday, the Republican attorney general in Georgia just unveiled an indictment against 61 people involved in the resistance to Stop Cop City using the now infamous Georgia RICO statute. Um, I've been spending the afternoon reading the uh, the indictment and actually just posted something. I posted the indictment on our on our website. You need to read it. Um, uh, it is an stunning, stunningly chilling of any form of protest and thought and speech and um, and, and, and cooperation. In a way, the indictment is a criminalization of cooperation. Um, and I, I, I mean it. I mean, it starts with these definitions. It starts with these definitions of what is anarchism, of what is, anar what is anarchist belief, what is mutual aid, what is the belief in mutual aid. It starts with a definition of uh, social solidarity and what solidarity is. And then it goes on to essentially suggest that anyone who was participating, um, I mean, they're focusing on particular acts, 225 acts, although many of them uh, appear to be ordinary forms of political protest. For instance, just, okay, just, 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 just one second. I mean, writing the telephone number of a lawyer or a bail fund on your arm, according to the indictment, is an indication of criminal intent. Right. So I mean, it's flipping, it's flipping reality on its head, right? People put the names of a lawyer when they go to a peaceful protest on their arm because they're likely they're going to get kettled and illegally arrested by the NYPD or the Atlanta police or whatever, right? I mean, you, you do that as a form of protection against illegal arrest. Well, right now, the way the indictment reads, that is, proof 
that you have a criminal mind and that you're intending to commit illegal acts, right? Just to, just to kind of like put you a little bit into the inverted warped ideology of the indictment itself. It's, it's a surprising, it's an extraordinary piece of work. I put it on the, I put it on the, uh, on the internet with a, with a, with a few comments, but, and, and obviously we can't not talk about that because it just happened, but really I want the focus tonight, at least in, in, for the most part to be on the positive side, the constructive side, uh, on all of the positive aspects of cooperation that come together to build an, a, a movement. Of course, the repression and cooperation are connected um, because uh, repression contributes to inter internal cohesion. Uh, it also tries to fragment internal cohesion often when it's uh, when 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 kind of there are counterinsurgency methods used to kind of blow up. Uh, but but repression and cooperation are clearly connected in many ways. It's impossible to think through any, any one of them without thinking of the other. But as much as possible in this seminar, we're going to be trying to focus on how forms of cooperation and working together flourish in these particular settings, in these particular social movements, in, temp in the effort at a temporary autonomous zone. How is cooperation nourished and achieved there? Um, and we want to use the Defend the Atlanta Forest and the ZAD, um, at uh, Notre Dame des Landes as, as models, paradigms uh, of what can be achieved uh, by cooperation. All right, so uh, let me turn the mic over then to Kamau Franklin, who is kind of like, we're really grateful that you, well, you and Tiffany and, and Andre were able to join us, but especially you and Tiffany from Atlanta, because I know that there's so much going on right there and we're pulling away from you away from important work, but thank you so much for coming up to Columbia to share what's going on and your thoughts. Thank you, and thank you for having me. And let me just start by saying, if I had went to a class like this in law school, I might still be practicing law. Never <laughs> in any class have I taken has an introduction of it been to talk about revolutionary and radical movements and cooperation and mutual aid and what that means, without even mentioning about what that means for the law, but just mentioning about what that means for society. Um, so it's a very interesting place to be at in terms of even having this type of discussion around basically movement building and organizing, right? So if I start the conversation about solidarity um, and cooperation and unity, and I'll do it within the context of Cop City, because I think that's obviously top of mind and something that folks would be interested in hearing about, um, we have to go back to 2020. We have to go back to when there was all across the country an upswing in movement politics or movement action, I should say, based on the continual police killing of Black people in this country, right? It wasn't the first time or anything of that nature, but obviously we were deep in COVID and there were several killings that happened one after another, Rashad Brooks, um, um, Breonna Taylor, George Floyd, these killings brought people back out into the street to protest police killing during a time of COVID. In fact, for me, it was like going from uh, a, a place of solitude where I was individually locked down with my immediate family for eight, nine months, not, never really leaving the house to go too far, to basically entering a Petri dish to go to a rally downtown where literally thousands of people came out to demonstrate against police violence. That was not only the origins of the movement, but according to this indictment, it also was the origins of a so-called criminal conspiracy because the police see, the police and prosecutor offices in the state see cooperation, see unity, see passion that says it wants to change the system as an attack against the system and want to be criminalized by that very system, right? Not one to be listened to, not one to be sort of let's take this into account. So when people were talking about uh, the abolishing the police, defunding the police, finding alternatives to public safety, the authorities that be decided to double down on repression of communities that were fighting back against police violence. 
So also during that time period where there were folks in the streets um, is where the idea of Cop City was not born, but was dusted off and brought out to be a reaction to the unity that was happening in the streets. And when we as organizers and activists of various stripes started to hear about Cop City, and we started to hear about its earliest iterations, um, a, a, a landing pad for Black Hawk helicopters, uh, over a dozen firing ranges, uh, mock urban cities to train in urban warfare and crowd control, um, the amount of land to be grabbed, the place where the land was grabbed, which was called to what is called the Walani Force. We've dubbed the Walani Force, which is next to a working class or adjacent to a working class black community where that land was actually promised to that community to be used for purposes of recreation, camping sites, parking, I mean, uh, walking trails, hiking trails, that kind of thing. All those plans were swept off the table and instead the idea of Cop City was built. Out of that came the unity of organizations and activists of various stripes and ideologies deciding to work together to stop this particular facility from being built. And when I say a, a, a range of different ideological perspectives, right? So obviously some of the things that you've already heard about, people who are anarchists, uh, of the left of the left, communists, socialists, folks who consider themselves revolutionaries, uh, people who were uh, consider themselves radicals, Two, people who were environmentalists, people who were community types, social justice folks, uh, folks who might be considered themselves liberals, uh, voting rights people, right? A whole range of different organizers and activists who normally don't always get together to express the common bond of unity saw in this project, and again, an extension of police violence against the larger community, right? An extension of police violence, one, against black and brown communities who are already being gentrified out of Atlanta as they're being gentrified out of New York. Um, and two, a police training facility that was large and had national and international implications, which was geared again towards stopping movement activity. This fostered a certain type of cooperation and unity that we don't always have when it comes to left projects, right? Part of that unity did take on a ethos that is really deep within the anarchist community. And that is uh, respecting a diversity of tactics. That is having a, a, a larger unit of organizing, let's say that is the leader list, as in there is not a, co a one centralized coalition where all the groups get together and decide things or vote on things or one particular person sort of dominates, becomes the public spokesperson for the particular ideas that are being expressed. But one in which different individuals and organizations and collectives gather together at times or in their individual spaces, do different kinds of work that propel the very general idea of what unity means. And in this case, that unity was saying we wanted to stop cop city, right? So that means some people did very public rallies and demonstrations, uh, town hall meetings, traditional organizing. Um, and some people did things that were not traditional, right? They did things that was spoken about earlier, which was living and going into the woods. In fact, at the time when we were organizing around Cop City and the city council took a vote. And at the time we had, this was again, still doing COVID. So it was a call-in mechanism we had the second largest call in ever for the city council in Atlanta for people protesting against Cop City. And still the city council voted to keep Cop City going, right? They decided to pass the, to pass the ordinance that allowed the mayor to sign on to the lease. In doing so, they also thought that they had crushed the movement. They crushed the organizing that came from, from their perspective out of, out of thin air, right? They saw the movement against police violence, they thought that was over. They thought this was gonna be an easy pass in terms of creating this facility. But instead, again, this movement forged and became strong. They thought by voting this ordinance and allowing this to come about that they would end the movement. But instead, the movement decided to take on an additional tactic that kept it going. That was the tactic of having folks 
actually move into the Walani forest. Some people stay there overnight. Some people stay there uh, for days and weeks. Some people just came and visit when they could visit. There were supply lines built. There was food uh, that was delivered. There were different ways in which people did fundraisers to make sure folks had their basic necessities met. There was concerts in the forest so that folks could have a good time together. Um, there were councils developed so that folks can work out strategies and ideas around how to live communally in that space. There was conflict in which groups had to figure out how they would relate to each other. There were accusations around issues of white supremacy or sexism. And so again, people had to figure out how would we keep this movement going, but at the same time, fight back or resolve some of these problems so that we don't bring these outside, what we could be considered like these outside larger societal issues to bear in these woods, right? Which is not to say they won't come in because that's the very nature of human beings gathering together is having both cooperation and at times conflict. And the question becomes, how do you work out mechanisms and means in which you resolve this to keep your larger strategic goal going. And we were able to do that. And then because we were able to do that, more repression came, right? That repression came in a form last year, uh, particularly in December of various policing agencies forming a task force, a task force that involved the Atlanta police, the DeKalb County police, the Georgia Bureau of Investigation, the Federal Bureau of Investigation, Homeland Security, and various prosecutorial offices. That task force decided to use the idea of domestic terrorism as a charge against organizers and activists. So to be clear, um, there were tactics that were used that were around burning down construction equipment, right? Some folks considered that to be violence. And when those things would happen, the media would reach out to some of us as media spokespeople to ask us to condemn the people and the acts. And the media's role, this being cor corporate media, was like, they are messing up your movement, right? They are doing these bad things. Shouldn't you respond by separating yourself from these acts? Our conclusion was, in terms of co cooperation, one that we had developed early, was that we would not throw other movement activists under the bus. We would not separate ourselves from tactics that involve the destruction of property over the issue of killing, over-policing, and the jailing of larger Black communities. So our basic reaction to those charges were, we do not consider, we do not consider the burning of property as violence. What we consider violence is the use of over-policing as a tactic and strategy that continually invades our community and creates the prison industrial complex that we have today. In Atlanta, which is now only 49% Black, which is built as the, well, builds itself as the so-called Black Mecca, at one point it was over 60% Black, but now it's only 49% Black, 90% of those arrested are, are Black folks. 90% of those arrested are Black folks. So our retort was, until the media starts talking about those things as violence, we will not even begin to have discussions around the destruction of property over human lives being lost at the hands of a state agency, which no one wants to rein in. That was the type of unity, controversial for some, but the type of unity we kept because we thought it was far more important to dramatize and to demonstrate that the unity of our larger political apparatus of working together was far more important than having outside fights around tactics. Now, it doesn't mean we all agreed on the tactics, particularly when tactics were used, where they were used, and all that kind of stuff. And it doesn't mean that at times that we had to call for certain discussions to be had with people. But what it does mean is that those were things that we tried to work out within the larger group to not let the state and or those who we think function on behalf of the state and or on behalf of capital and developers and private corporations turn us against each other. So in that way, we continue to build community, even when there was a struggle to build community over things that people would consider controversial or even things that people would consider to be breaking the law, right? 
So those were things that helped us build and stack Unity on top of that, right? So during the time period where domestic terrorism arrests started to be made in December, and then in January, they made another raid into force and again arrested another six or seven people for domestic terrorism and then killed Manuel Tortuguita Charan, an organizer, activist, forest defender, some, some would say the first environmental activists killed in the United States. They again, and they, they cleared out the forest defenders and thought they had broken our unity or our ability to cooperate with each other, right? But we only again switched tactics again to be more demonstrative and demonstrative by resurging our effort to charge at City Hall, where there were upcoming votes on giving the funding for Cop City that were coming up. And in two successive organizing efforts, we brought out more people for public comment than had ever happened in the history of Atlanta, still ignored by the city council on both occasions, where they passed, they said publicly that it was gonna be 30 million, but then we found out through open records requests that they actually gave 60, over $60 million to the Atlanta Police Foundation to build Cop City. They ignored that. And again, they thought by doing this, they had destroyed or shut down the movement. And that's when the movement shifts to its current phase of not abandoning all other tactics, but again, going back to something that in some places could be a considered a traditional tactic, but in Atlanta, it was a novice idea. We decided to push for a referendum. There's the constitutional, uh, uh, provisions within the Georgia state constitution and within the charter of the city of Atlanta that allow for a referendum to, to dispel or to take back an ordinance that is passed by the city council. That has never been tried in Atlanta, particularly one that was uh, started by the people as opposed to the city council. To do this, we needed to collect 15% of eligible voters in the last mayoral election which came out to be 58,000 signatures. To this date, we've collected over 130,000 signatures. Yes, that does give a round of applause. That is more signatures than the people who voted for the current mayor. That is more signatures than everyone who voted in the last mayoral election. Still, it does not guarantee that we're gonna get that on the ballot for votes, to be clear. But the fact that that tremendous amount of unity was held, where again, folks from national and international uh, uh, organizations and individuals started coming to Atlanta to join forces, which can always be a difficult process, anybody who has been involved in organizing, right? You have this thing of organizing in today's world where incidents happen or things happen and people rush in from out of town. And that could be good, then that can also be problematic when we talk about what's considered in organizing terms, the nonprofit industrial complex, right? When folks rush in, they do things, it seems performative, and then foundations give them checks, right? What we had were checks and balances for folks who were coming in. And folks understood that they had to relate to the movement that was already happening, that part of coming in and operating in Atlanta in its current context meant that you could not come in and separate yourself from the movement that was happening for the last two years on the ground, in which again, people have been charged with, uh, with criminal acts, with felony acts, when people have been killed, right? That, that, was a, that was not something that we could allow to happen. So what we did was held people accountable. Those folks held up their end, they brought resources, they brought people, and we were able to accomplish what we accomplished. We're in the middle of that as we speak, and I'll wrap up with this. Um, as of a day ago, something that we had long uh, suspected would happen, right? Again, based on Freedom of Information Acts, open records requests, was that the larger movement would be charged as a racketeering organization, right? Was not something that was surprising to us, maybe the timing after so long of knowing that it might be coming. But again, it was a perfect fit for what the city, the state, the county has decided to do to us. The more the movement has grown 
and has shown cooperation and solidarity and mutual aid, the stronger the movement became, the more scared the authorities are that they cannot stop the movement, which means for them, the more, let's say, blatant and destructive tactics that they have at their ability, they will use to stop our movement. So for all of you who are either involved in organizing, either as individuals, or as potential lawyers, understand this. Your role in terms of movement and movement support is not to break away when things get hard, but to create a stronger sense of unity because people have now not only sacrificed their lives unattendedly, but their whole future is at stake because they're now being criminalized by a state that is scared that people are trying to take power to redistribute that power, to have a say in how power works, as opposed to letting a small group of people decide what's best for community and people. So just remember your role in movement is to hold that movement together. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Kamal. That was um, that was a brilliant and, and fascinating description of actually the history of the transformation of the strategies in response to the different reactions. Um, and also uh, really helpful at thinking through how unity is created with the kind of internal challenges and then the external challenges of the media and then, of course, the external challenges of the police. We'll come back to that a little bit. Let's turn to Tiffany. Now, though, thank you uh, for joining us, and you've been involved uh, on a on a very on on, a, on another aspect of this. So, why don't you why don't you tell us about it? Sure. Um, so, for those of you who are not familiar with the Southern Center for Human Rights, uh, we are a nonprofit law firm in Atlanta. Our mission is to decriminalize race and poverty. Um, I came to Southern Center after being an organizer for my entire legal career. I left the public defender's office because I was forced to make a choice between organizing or practicing public defense because the county said that I was using the county's name uh, to say certain things about police and policing. Um, I was also deeply impacted by the limitations of the law, right? Um, the, the tactic of litigation is, um, one grounded in a white supremacist fixture of law, right? That we that we are under in this country, uh, the practice of which people like me really did not have access for quite some time. And even with that, in public defense, my my clients had a very difficult time knowing that I couldn't help them with their excessive force case, right? I couldn't help them. Uh, with police abuses, except for maybe a successful motion to have something dismissed. What organizing permitted me to do was to um, respect the whole client, right? the whole community member, um, to see all of the different fixtures in our society that greatly impact the way that they experience the world, um, that greatly limits the, the way that they are able to actualize, right? The, the future that they want for themselves and their communities, greatly limited by societal fixtures and the law. So then what does it mean to work for a law firm that uses law as a tactic? How do you hold that as a harm reductive tactic while also staying in your place, right? And when I say staying in your place, I mean, when you get a law degree or really any advanced degree, people assign to you a certain level of respect that you have not earned. You have not learned, earned respect, you've earned your degree. That's of little consequence, right? You earn the respect of the communities that you serve by demonstrating that you will not cause harm to those communities. And in many respects as lawyers, that means that we are willing to step away from status, position, education, right? income and say, I come into this work with humility, where am I needed? And if you can figure out where you're needed and be honest with the community about the limitations, your own limitations. And I keep saying limitations because 
it is important to never lose your revolutionary imagination. It is important for the things that you dream of for future generations to be boundless. But as a practitioner, you also have to be grounded in what is practical, right? what is possible in the short term, the midterm, and the long term. So in addition to doing uh, impact litigation at Southern Center, so we sue the government a lot, um, we do capital litigation, we um, represent people sentenced to death. Uh, we have a policy unit, which is the unit that I direct. And for a very long time, Southern Center, um, even before Occupy, so uh, during the Iraq war, would, would offer our office space to lawyers and protesters who, uh, protesters who needed representations and lawyer, representation and lawyers that needed help. Um, beginning with the 2013, I would say 2013, 2014, protests related to the killing of Trayvon Martin, we started to see larger scale protests happening in Atlanta, but we still have these all call meetings. Sometimes it would be at Southern Center, but our office at that time was really small. I was just out of law school. Um, sometimes it would be at other C3 organizations. I think even at one point when Kamal was at another organization, they would host these meetings. We would bring people into the room, say, raise your hand if you think you want joint defense, meaning uh, would you like to be represented with other clients with similar interests and goals? And then raise your hand if you want individual representation. We would do the same thing with the lawyers. Are you comfortable with JDAs? Are you comfortable? Um, what would you prefer individual representation? Who's handled a felony? Okay, you haven't, all right, do you need help, right? This is, it was just very informal. But we were always together, physically together. In 2020, that was not possible. Okay. Um, the killing of Ahmaud Aubrey was something that many of us knew about uh, because the community in Southeast Georgia started to call up to Atlanta for help. And we, our, our practice and our politics is to not parachute into communities and tell them what they need. So we were kind of standing by to see what exactly Mr. Aubrey's family needed. So it's the NAACP, so were many other people. Um, and then the video hit the internet. And I would say that that was one of the points, so that was like March, Ahmaud um, Aubrey was killed February 23rd, 2020. And I want to say it was maybe uh, March of that year where people started to be activated, but it's still, there were still no arrests happening. Um, after the killing of George Floyd, we started to see arrests and we then started to see money pouring into bail funds all over the country. But the, um, the manner in which we helped to coordinate the representation of protesters was no longer practical because no one's office was open anymore, right? Uh, people didn't really quite understand how they could avoid getting sick. Uh, and the courts weren't open. Our jail, we had, before COVID, threatened to sue the jail again for overcrowding. So we were actively trying to decarcerate jails in, in Metro Atlanta when all of this happened. Um, and Solidarity Fund had bail money. So it at least allowed people to get out of jail. Uh, and then after the 2020 protests happened, we started to see the, the backlash. It's important to note that another really long day of public comment was over Rayshard Brooks bill. So there was, a, have you all heard of the Rayshard Brooks bill? So Rayshard Brooks bill was a uh, municipal legislation that would have withheld additional funding from the Atlanta Police Department until certain modest reforms were put in place. And I mean, these were like eight can't wait, project, a campaign zero. These were not radical, right? Um, in response to that, the Atlanta Police Department called, they did their blue flu, they, they called out from work. And Cop City, uh, there was uh, the, the executive director of the Atlanta Police Foundation published an opinion piece. And it was, it was, it was offered as a response to detractors from Mayor Bottoms who said that she wasn't fighting crime. And it said it was uh, offering to the community, well, she really does care about crime because she's about to let us build Cop City. That was essentially what the op-ed was. Okay. Rayshard Brooks bill in 2020 was 23 hours of public comment over the budget 
and city council, we had sponsors, we had the votes and the sponsors for that legislation to pass. And between the beginning of that hearing and the end of the hearing, many of those votes flipped and it didn't pass. And the reason I'm mentioning these things is because the, in movement, the ground has to be tilled. Cop City didn't come out of nowhere, right? When we started organizing around police in 2008, you maybe could get 40 people in a room. But those 40 people who are in the room are still in rooms today because it's people like Mal and some of our other friends. We acknowledged that sort of this informal way of matching protesters with lawyers was not sustainable because the state was escalating. Every time there was a protest, there was more violence. Every time there was a protest, um, we started to feel less and less secure that our legal observers were not going to be arrested. We had NLG uh, lawyer legal observers arrested in 2020. We continue to see that now as a fixed risk. Okay. Um, the other pieces that had to come together were in addition to like people want to be paid, we need far more lawyers. Um, lawyers need education and flanking. So we had calls every single week with the lawyers who represented protesters um, from the 2020 protest and forward. It would be members of uh, workers from the bail fund, lawyers from Southern Center and other lawyers who are representing protesters. And we would have rooms where lawyers can have private conversations, but it wasn't physical rooms. This was all on Zoom. Uh, we were able to work on amnesty, um, uh, broad amnesty initiatives through um, conversations with one of the prosecutors to have dozens of cases dismissed all at once. Because again, we could not provide lawyers for, we had 600 perky cases or something like that that summer. And here we are now with people being charged with domestic terrorism. Well, if it's hard to get people to um, represent folks with criminal trespass and jaywalking cases because they don't want to get sick, their practices are struggling, right? So the economic toll taken um, on everyone in this country still hit lawyers, especially private practitioners. There is an attrition in giving to nonprofit organizations. Um, so then we also had that fact, but now, the, the uh, deployment of domestic terrorism charges against top city protesters is the first time in Georgia history that the statute has been used. The domestic terrorism statute in Georgia was passed after Dylan Roof um, killed worshipers at Mother Emanuel Church in, in South Carolina. It was billed just like many other, um, like hate crimes bills are, are offered as a way to address racist, racist violence, hate crimes. Uh, but we knew at the time that any criminal penalty in this country will first disproportionately impact black people, brown people, poor people, and queer people. It is just the way that it works. Um, and sure enough, we see movement working to actively assist black people, poor people, queer people, and brown people are the first folks to be charged with domestic terrorism. And it is an offense that requires an underlying felony or an underlying act. And in the warrants, you see things like laying in a hammock, right? When they were raiding the forest and they killed Tortuguita. Our work now is building solidarity, not just across the legal profession, but encouraging the legal profession to more broadly ex, uh, accept that they must be in solidarity with community first. So, uh, and when I say that, I mean, um, we get, well, I don't wanna represent Cox City protesters because it's just a lot of privileged white kids coming, wanting to burn stuff down. Um, they're, they, they want too much, they're too demanding, right? Um, I don't have time for that. So they were willing to do it in 2020, but the state has successfully crafted and distorted the narrative, right? So that is not the reality of the people who are, are demonstrating, but it is all the narrative work, right? So Ida B. Wells said, the people who commit the murders write the reports, right? And 
what we are seeing in real time is this push and pull between um, the government. So it's like, if you're thinking about legal support for protesters, on one side, you've got community asking for help. And on the other side, you've got the government telling lawyers, just like they try to get us to come on the news and complain about tactics, telling lawyers that their time should be better spent. And now with this indictment yesterday, the threat is also, and you might be charged. It's not lost on us that we are not safe. Um, the, the work of pairing lawyers with protesters is just one part of it. Right? And there are all of these different things that we try to do to make sure that we don't jeopardize the lawyer-client relationship. So we're not representing the protesters. We want to, to, to allow lawyers and, and clients to um, enjoy the privilege and the confidentiality that the bar rules and the law grants them. We don't wanna pierce the veil or any of that stuff. Um, but it's hard because we are also so accustomed to helping people on, um, on their cases, um, with, their, with their issues. So I, we are now with the indictment, there are 61 people charged in the RICO from yesterday. And it probably is and counting. Right, um, forty some out of those people were already charged with domestic terrorism. Some people are charged with uh, for canvassing in Bartow County, where some of the Georgia State Patrol officers who killed Georgia Pizza lived, for literally passing out a flyer that had the names and the what was it, the addresses of the officers who killed Tort, and they have been arrested and they're charged uh, with racketeering in this indictment. What the state has effectively done, it, is, it has uh, made it really clear that they have criminalized the right to bear witness, right? They have criminalized truth telling. And some people say that it's not a lawyer's job to tell the truth, right? There are all kinds of jokes there. But at the end of the day, it is our responsibility to facilitate our clients telling of their stories. Right, and it is possible that that facilitation in and of itself can put lawyers in harm's way for being arrested, or accused of racketeering. If Venmoing someone $20, $40, if purchasing a water hose so that people can bathe in the forest is uh, part of a conspiracy and the conspiracy as alleged in the indictment is a belief system. So what they say is solidarity, mutual aid, anarchy, anarchism, and collectivism are um, the conspiracy. So that means anything beyond depending on the government, not only for your very right to breathe and live, but also on the government to frame what the truth is for your community, is now considered a criminal act under our, our attorney general. So we do political education, skills training and other things, but one of the, I'll just go back to the most important thing from our vantage point is that we are not imposing our own importance on movement work. We're, we don't disqualify people for assistance based on what they're charged with. Uh, we don't disqualify people for assistance based on where they live. The outside agitator um, narrative that the mayor has assisted the state in rolling out. Uh, we don't disqualify people on the basis of income, right? So it, it isn't a project that requires people to be of modest means because everyone is doing what they're doing in service of the greater good. And so centering that means that um, we have to know when to shut up and not be lawyers. We have to know when it's time to, to behave and interact with people. True cooperation is everyone coming to the table, knowing who you are and what you're bringing, knowing what you can concede and like not, and not um, wandering off into the other co-op, which is co-optation. Because the thing that I'll leave you with is if uh, any of you decide to do community work and you end up doing community work at a nonprofit organization, especially at a grass tops organization, 
there is an impulse that says, if you are the one with the resources, you are the one with the education, you are the one with the microphone, you are the one who the press calls, then you are the one who gets to call the plays, and you are the one who gets to direct. When in all actuality, every single idea that you are bringing to the table likely came from an impacted person that you're supposed to be serving. So cooperation also re re requires the shunning of co-optation and a constant reevaluation of where you have erred so that you can continue to serve. And so that's what we're trying to do through this bridge project and through all of the work uh, that we do at Southern Center. It's one part of a much larger whole is, I would be delighted if our work wasn't necessary in the future. That's, that's the world that I want to see. And we are hoping that we can better acquaint more Georgia lawyers with that same ideology rather than just helping them keep money in their coffers for their practices. Thank you so much, Tiffany. So I think we're gonna, there's a, one line there that I think is gonna stick with us maybe uh, all year as we think about cooperation is distinguishing that other co-op, <laughs> uh, co-optation. So yeah, uh, fabulous. A fascinating way in which you spotlighted the, the forms of cooperation that are necessary within the legal profession and between and within the legal profession in the community. Um, so, uh, and we'll come back to that in a moment. And also something, I mean, one thing that becomes so clear as you were discussing this and, you know, in the, in the light of the indictment is the way in which it is really actually, it's the, it's the cooperation that is the most threatening object here for the state in a way, um, which is a fascinating point that we'll, we'll come back to. Uh, all right. So Andre, um, thanks for joining us. Um, and you're going to kind of bring the conversation into dialogue with uh, with other Zads, uh, Tazes, um, and with your work on uh, Notre Dame des Landes. So welcome and thanks for joining us. Uh, first, thank you for having me, Bernard. And um, thank you to Tiffany and Kamal for for being here as well. Um, I hope that my uh, remarks don't take us too far afield um, from from where we're at now. Um, uh, but as Bernard said, I'd like to to try and connect uh, what's happening in Atlanta with, with some things that have happened in France at the uh, ZAD in Notre Dame des Landes, which I wrote um, a short essay about for the for the blog about different forms of cooperation there. Um, I'm going to speak a little bit today about some things that we may have already touched on, um, fear, um, and uh, spotlight some other forms of cooperation that are common to both both of these movements. Um, I do apologize if it starts on a bit of a um, melancholic note, but I uh, I think it'll end in a, a more positive one. Um, okay. So, our world is in a state of utter ruin. In July, the daily global mean surface air temperature record was broken four days in a row. Uncontrollable wildfires have ravaged islands in Greece and Hawaii. In the past year, the US Supreme Court has both overturned Roe versus Wade and dismantled affirmative action. The war in Ukraine rages on. Right-wing fascist regimes continue to gain ground around the world. Globalization's rampant expansion persists. Socioeconomic inequality promulgates ceaselessly. More than ever, it feels as if the world is riddled by violence, oppression, hostility, and crisis. More than ever, it feels as if we no longer share a world in common. But this is a, a line from a French anarchist poet that I quote often uh, by the name of Jean Marie Claise. He writes, uh, Oui, nous habitons vos ruines, mais. Yes, we live in your ruins, but everything happens in that little word at the end of the phrase, that suspended but that opens an independent clause that is never closed. This but is a provocation, a gesture of refusal, a space in which possibilities and alternatives are invited to take root and to flourish. Yes, we live in your ruins, but other worlds are out there, other worlds that exist within this one. 
people everywhere are building them. A different world is being built in every protest, in every uprising, in every occupied square, in every riot, in every squat, in every strike. These worlds, these worlds are being built on the ruins of the present, springing up between its cracks, spreading out in its undercommons, occupying its abandoned buildings, perching in its trees, blocking its pipelines, obstructing its railways. These worlds depend on cooperation, cooperation between the people who build them, cooperation with the land and the environment upon which these worlds are built, cooperation with the myriad forms of life with whom these worlds are shared. They also depend on a refusal to cooperate with the state, with governance, with institutions, with corporations, with any force of domination. These worlds crop up in many places throughout time and space. They take many shapes and have many names. I'll name a few of them. The Paris Commune, the Oaxaca Commune, Stonewall, Occupy, Tarnac, Woodbine, Cooperation Jackson, Standing Rock, Stop Line 3. In each of these worlds, people have joined together and cooperated to collectively develop tools and practices in, in order to live autonomously, to continuously imagine and construct alternative horizons. Tonight, we're discussing two such worlds, the Zona Défendre, or the ZAD, as I'll refer to it, at Notre Dame des Landes, and the Stop Cop City, Defend the Atlanta Forest Movement. As I pointed out in the short post I wrote ahead of tonight's event, these two movements share several features. Undergirding each is a foundation of grassroots cooperation, resistance, and popular mobilization. They each aim to block the development of a construction project, in the case of the ZAD, an airport. Both movements refuse any institutional or state mediation. After all, both of these movements have faced repressive state violence, um, as Kamal and Tiffany have mentioned. And in the case of Stop Cop City, this resulted in the murder of forest defender Manuel Tortuguita Teran, who was shot 57 times by the police. Both of these movements are also animated by an ecological concern. In banding together and occupying a territory, the resistors and rebels of both movements are not only defending a local environment, they are also defending a relation to the world and the variegated beings and forms that compose, compose it. Each are, to borrow, uh, to borrow Hugh Farrell's words about the Atlanta forest, quote, not just refuges from a reactionary moment, but testing grounds for bottom-up ecological resilience and abolitionist politics. Indeed, the violence from the police and the state to which both worlds have been subjected is perhaps not only a product of their resistance to a specific or particular project, but also because they offer us different kinds of models and methods with which to reimagine our political horizons and to compose new lines of flight out of the grip of domination. They are both salient examples of what is possible when resistance operates on a basis of cooperation and openness. On the ZAD, for example, all the occupants would take on the same name, the name Kami, when inhabiting the territory, thus counteracting the police's identificatory efforts and inhibiting any potential relation with the French state. While taking on the same name as a way to exclude the police, it also serves an inclusionary as well as strategic purpose. Having the same name uh, contributed on the Z to making it an environment open to people from all walks of life, regardless of gender, race, class, age, etc. Speaking under a single shared name also engendered a horizontality that helped build connections between groups and participate in a perpetual collective process of forging community while preserving the heterogeneity of practices and perspectives circulating within it. In the Wielani Forest in Atlanta, Seemingly disparate groups and populations coexist and cooperate without being compelled to assimilate to a particular way of doing things. This allows for cooperation as opposed to competition between political visions. Thus, while some participants fight Cop City with the Book of Law or by teaching the racist history of the Atlanta City prison farm, others complement this effort with physical confrontations with the police. Others engage differently helping to establish different structures, such as a kitchen called the Wilani Cafe, where meals for forest defenders are cooked and served, or cultivating plots of land for trees, vegetables, and herbs. The diversity of the Stop Cop City movement allows for the deployment of many different ways to block the project and makes their actions unpredictable and difficult to counter. And so when forest defenders are charged with, quote unquote, domestic terrorism for sitting in the trees, or clashing with the police, 
or when the homes of those organizing solidarity funds for the movement are raided by gun-toting SWAT teams. What is expressed here is not the concern that some building project will be blocked. No, these are the immediately visible symptoms of a broader concern, something that I think is the forging of a continuity between political thought and action. Instead of resistance and resilience existing only in the realm of thought and theory, on the ZAD and in Atlanta, they also come to exist on the terrain of action, becoming a gesture to be continuously enacted and reenacted, one that refuses to be managed or restricted by the limits laid out by the law and the state. These worlds are microcosms of a more general threat to domination. I'll quote the Invisible Committee here, who I think are quite relevant to what's happened yesterday in Atlanta as well. They write, quote, Anti-terrorism claims to attack the possible future of a quote-unquote criminal association. But what is really being attacked is the future of the situation. The possibility that behind every grocer, a few bad intentions are hiding, and behind every thought, the acts that it calls for. The possibility expressed by an idea of politics, which cannot be relegated to the storeroom of freedom of expression. And so what strikes fear in the heart of domination is the existence of those who refuse to be paralyzed by the social, economic, environmental, and geopolitical crises of the present. Those who can no longer sit idly by, awaiting the fulfillment of the promises spewed by the established order. Those who rise up and attempt to fight the sordid state of the world they perceive. It is a fear of the possible, of those who believe in another way of living, in another world, and their willingness to engage in a war with domination to actualize its possibility. So what concerns the state and its forces of order is not the so-called success or failure of this or that project. Rather, I think it is the ripples of resonance that emanate from the ZAD and from the Wilani forest in Atlanta. The act of building another world is also is the bringing forth of something into existence, which in turn brings forth the possibility of a world's vibration reverberating elsewhere in a manner that will elicit other acts, other gestures that communicates and cooperates with other worlds, that connects them, that makes them more powerful, more threatening to the normative state of affairs. Hakim Bain is writing on the Taz in the Temper Autonomous Zone, refers to this as a movement spirit, right? an immaterial it intensity that surpasses the lifespan of a given world, that moves beyond its historical frame. Or as Kristen Ross puts it, um, she writes, quote, the thought of a movement is generated only with and after it, unleashed by the creative energies and excess of the movement itself. Actions produce dreams and ideas and not the reverse. And so what the actions of the ZAD at the Notre Dame des Landes, the defenders of the Wilani Forest tell us what their spirits conjure can be summed up, I think, by a six, very succinct statement in the closing pages of Bernard's cooperation, in which he writes, we can do this together now. The temporality of the now that Ber Bernard emphasizes here is significant. It indicates the same kind of urgency that animates Hakim Bey's description of the Taz, in which he writes vociferously against waiting for revolution or founding a movement based on rational reasoning dictated by the churning wheels of progress. After all, the forces of order would prefer if we deferred to them to manage, to manage crises or resolve conflict divesting action from politics and sapping both of their intensity. This is why Hakim Bey turns away from the very concept of revolution and with it the state, opting instead to think in the grammar of the uprising or of the insurrection. He describes the uprising as being unbound from temporality and allergic to circumscription. He describes it as a quote unquote, shimmying up the pole and out of the smoke hole, end quote, um, emerging to shoot the clocks and to suspend history. The uprising does not know what it might be, what it may become. It is not an end in itself, but a pure means, a way of perpetually creating an immediate different present than the one we already have, here where there is nothing but waiting, expecting, and hoping in vain. Now, in spite of the immediacy and urgency that animate them, uh, the Zad and Stop Cop City, and especially the Zad, I think, sit somewhat uneasily against the other elements of Hakim Bey's understanding of, this, of the uprising. His version is predicated on his invisibility, disappearance, on the double movement of strike and retreat. And above all, the uprising is temporary. 
its provisional nature is what imbues it with its power. Now, certainly some of the tactics and practices internal to both of these movements tarry with this evasiveness and nomadism. Uh, in my essay, I wrote about how on the Zad, um, cabins were built and used as mobile bases and shelters that were resistant to permanent demolition. Accounts of the efforts to defend the Atlanta forest described forest defenders luring the police into quote unquote fruitless entanglements in the forest uh, before they before running away and vanishing into the trees. And of course, to both of the for both of these struggles, duration is um, is key, as they each rely on sustained widespread engagement with activism and activism to maintain their resistance. This said, um, one of the enduring questions, at least regarding the Zad and Notre Dame de Londres, is uh, regarding its longer lifespan. Um, its occupants have expressed the desire to go beyond thinking of it as a temporary autonomous zone, um, and as they would prefer to build what they refer to as a um, as or a permanent autonomous zone. Um, and I think they argue for this quite in a quite beautiful manner. They write, quote, we can't just let go of all the ties we built here with the locals, surrounding farmers, pensioners, workers in the city, wanderers of all sorts, not students and the youth, the owls, the black squirming salamanders, the gnarly oak trees, the mud. We must hold on to all these deep friendships and networks of struggle that we have shared with such intensity over the last decade. So in spite of this, this process of permanence has been a fraught one. Um, while the plans to build an airport on the territory were definitively halted in 2018, um, occupants have continued to struggle against eviction efforts by the French state. Um, some have applied for legal recognition of the structures they have built in order to remain on the territory, while others have refused any process that would include the state in the collective management of the land. And so the struggle there continues, this time as a fight for permanent autonomy. Perhaps we can pose the case of the Zad as a kind of open question to the Defend the Atlanta Forest movement. Uh, what's occurring in Atlanta is still ongoing, certainly, but participants may be faced with the same considerations sooner rather than later. Should we understand autonomy as being wholly incompatible with recognized permanence, as Hakim Bey certainly seems to suggest? Does engaging with the state, even in a totally antagonistic, oppositional manner, inevitably reinforce its power and legitimize its very existence? I can't say I, I have the answers to these questions, but perhaps we can we can ponder them together. But if we put them to the side for now, I think it's uh, it's interesting to consider the Zad and Stop Cop City as uprisings. And when I say that, I mean to consider them solely as means. I think we have the tendency to think of both of these movements um, in relation solely to their objectives, solely to their goals, right? The Stop Cop City moniker suggests this. Um, it tells us exactly what it aims to do. These goals are important, certainly, but they also, I think, obscure our ability to perceive those other practices that are crucial to grasp what it means to experience these movements, to experience the uprising, to understand what it would mean to be embedded in its textures. Because, of course, this experience involves conflict and resistance, both nonviolent and violent, but it also involves collective meals, intellectual and cultural exchanges, debates about graffiti tags and slogans. It involves communal art making. It involves people on the Zad singing, dancing, and playing instruments in front of burning police cars, or Atlanta forest defenders organizing multi-day music festivals under the canopy of trees. More than just about blocking a project, these two movements are about people living, building, fighting, and sharing together, smiling together, crying together, screaming together, struggling together. They're about people teaching each other how to construct a tree set, how to build a cabin, how to erect a barricade, or how to best cultivate the land or grow a tree. As I wrote in my essay, uh, both of these movements are just as much laboratories of insurgent imagination as they are concrete realizations of resistance, community, and cooperation. They are agonistic, yet joyful experiences in common that materialize against all odds, cutting across the ruins of the present. There are experiences in which people cooperate in an effort, in the words of uh, Peter Paul Pelbart, to quote, sustain the disparity of worlds, forms of life, points of view, rhythms, gestures, intonations, sensations, and encourage its proliferation rather than seize it in a universal modulation. 
such that each singularity preserves not its identity, but its power of affectation and envelopment in the immense game of the world. In the Zad at Notre Dame des Landes and in the Atlanta forest, political praxis and everyday life cooperate, they intertwine, and they become inseparable, opening access, is, opening access to new uses of the self and of life itself. Thank you. Thank you, Andre. Um, that was a beautiful bringing together of many of the themes uh, for this evening um, with a focus which I thought was so powerful on the experience, right? The experience of participating, um, which I think is, uh, I want to come back to. Um, as I was listening and thinking, and I've just been kind of obsessed by this indictment this afternoon, I was, I was, I was just realizing, you know, it kind of the civil rights movement was a RICO conspiracy under these terms, in a way, right? That's that's what it was. It was a RICO conspiracy, um, a racketeering practice uh, that involved illegal acts like trespass and sit-ins illegal acts like integration in spaces where it was illegal, um, which involved also forms of destruction. I mean, there were, I mean, not everyone was, uh, was nonviolent in the, in, the, in the way that King uh, espoused, and yet those were parts of the civil rights movement. And so one could take the framework of this indictment actually, and, and, and write an indictment of the civil rights movement, you know, which is stunning in a way. Um, actually, actually, it would actually be even less kind of ideas and thoughts and ideologies than, than this indictment is, which is so much about the idea of solidarity or and the practice of mutual aid. I mean, it would be even, it would be a, a more straightforward, simple uh, uh, racketeering practice, which makes you realize how both how 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 this is raising fundamental questions not only about ideas and ideology, but also about civil disobedience, right? Because I mean, civil disobedience is inherently an an illegal act, right? That's that, that's how civil disobedience is defined. In fact, that's what the disobedience is. It's a disobedience to a law. Direct civil disobedience, indirect civil disobedience as well, are illegal acts that are being done out of the necessity of the situation. And in a way, um, what, this, what this indictment does is pave the way for an entirely, for a a truly fascistic take on civil disobedience, um, which is very frightening. Um, now, now, of course, the other thing that's uh, particularly, well, that's tough, tricky uh, about thinking about cooperation in this context is the fact that um, these efforts are in some way anti-cooperative in the sense of cooperating with the dominant regime of, uh, of, of, of racial oppression, of social and class and gender oppression. Um, and so, of course, we're using the term cooperation to try and figure out how uh, movement work works, but it's nested within uh, an act of non-cooperation with the reigning framework. And it's important to keep that in mind because I mean when I mean because I mean in a in a way we need we need to think about what is the response to that critique, I think. What is the response to the critique that no, this isn't these aren't forms of cooperation. These are these are illegal, right? This is exactly what the what the indictment makes us think. No, these are illegal acts. How can illegal acts be forms of cooperation, right? Um, okay, now um, I, I, the three presentations were really extraordinary, uh, starting uh, with Kamau's 
kind of articulation of the of the way in which unity is produced. And, and that was one of the key words, unity. Um, unity, which is uh, tied to cooperation. And the way in which the different strategies at um, uh, Defend the Atlanta Forest change over time um, in response to, as it were, kind of pressure being put on certain forms of successful cooperation. So it's almost a kind of like a dialectical relationship between cooperation and and its response. Uh, the fascinating the way, right, in which the media was playing this and plays this function of trying to create internal discord in a movement, doing it in a typical media way, right? I mean, let's try and, you know, find the clickbait uh, to to get people to you know more people on the site, but how it's interesting. It was fascinating when you were talking, Kamal, the way in which actually the media is playing this count, counterinsurgency role, right? So we're we're familiar with counterinsurgency war practices. One of the central one is to infiltrate and create discord within a movement. Um, that was done with the Black Panthers. That was done. That was done at Standing Rock. It was done. The, the 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 documents from um, Tiger Swan uh, that document the way in which they were entering into the movement to create conflict and to kind of try and blow the movement up are stunning. They're on the um, um, actually there's a reference to them on the on the on the, on the website. Uh, the Intercept had remarkable exposés of that. But it's interesting how the media was doing that in a way to try in out of its own profit motive, trying to create discord. Now, uh, one of the one of the points I, I hope maybe you could develop on Kamau was is the first forms of solidarity and which were the internal mechanisms. I mean, you spoke first about internal conflicts and mechanisms to resolve. Then you spoke about the external one with the media and then the external one with the police. But on the first one, I think um, it would be interesting to hear how, how the, the movement is formed and how those initial internal elements of conflict um, are resolved through cooperation. I felt that that would be something that would be important. And, um, and, and, and in part, it ties to this notion of openness. I think openness to difference, which is an interesting, I think there's an interesting relationship between openness and cooperation. Difficult because what we're talking about are very targeted interventions, right? Where everyone really does care about the strategy and the result. And yet there needs to be a way of keeping it open so that people aren't, um, aren't kneecapping each other, right? So I was hoping that you could you could start there. Um, uh, Tiffany, uh, what I found fascinating, I mean, uh, everything was fascinating, but this idea of building solidarity within the legal profession and the legal profession to the community. Now, of course, in the way in which law is structured, that is, that there is, there are internal there are internal structural problems within legal practice that produce a form of individualized representation that makes it very difficult for legal practice to be in solidarity with the community, or which makes that question very difficult. Um, because attorneys, and, and, and attorneys who are gonna be representing uh, the folks who have been indicted on this RICO are gonna have a very different time negotiating the space between the individual representation and obligations to the individual of trying to simply minimize the damage, which is what an attorney is, is required to do representing a client, right? And, um, and engaging in kind of traditional forms of criminal defense, which is what we criminal defense attorneys do, right? I mean, you just try and how, how do you make sure that your client is not damaged <laughs> as much as possible, right? And those will often involve um, 
monthly discussions, uh, working through things, having people, I mean, you see it all the time, that conflicts, there are, there are internal conflicts there probably with community, community interests, with movement interests. And so, um, so I'd be interested to explore a little bit more how we do formulate that cooperation. I'm sure this is something you think about all the time between the legal profession and the community when there is this individualized representation model that, that we have to pay attention to. And then, um, Andre, I was, so I'm particularly taken by the notion of the experience here, um, in part, uh, well, you can probably know why, but um, spending a lot of time with the early Foucault, which was all about experience. So, um, and so the experience is something about, it's, it's the means, it's the journey, it's not the end right it's it's it, it's in it's it's fully experiencing the moment for its own sake in contrast to the end you spoke about it as a distinction between the goal maybe and the experience of course and and i i heard you saying something about the fact that this means orient it's kind of like the, the trajectory the means towards the goal the importance of the means towards the goal is somehow related to the distinction between uprisings and revolutions in hakim bey's words um but also the distinction between a temporary and a permanent autonomous zone um and i heard you saying or uh, valuing the the notion of a permanent autonomous zone, but I wonder. But it almost feels as if if the if what we're putting our if what we're focusing on is the experience, the means, the trajectory. Maybe there is something really valuable with the temporary nature of the autonomous zone rather than kind of entrenching something uh, forever, right? Because the forever is kind of the goal, but it almost feels as if it's the traje trajectory uh, that matters. So I wanted to hear more about that. So maybe we could um, just have a quick round of, of thoughts and also feel free to kind of address each other's comments as well. And then uh, we'll open it up to the floor and uh, questions. So. Um, We'll pass a mic around. Do you want to uh, come out and start? Sure. sure. Um, before I get to the exact question, I wanted to be clear on sort of one nuance, particularly of the charges of domestic terrorism. Um, and because of the indictment, and hopefully some of you will go back and read, which lit a bunch of acts, right, that it attributes to the larger movement. The overwhelming majority of people who've been arrested and charged with domestic terrorism, and I think this was alluded to, who are actually doing nothing except sitting in trees, being at demonstrations, uh, being at music festivals. The attorneys general and or other prosecutors don't have any evidence to suggest that either prior to their arrest and or during their arrest, they were involved in any other such behavior, except that they had a political belief system or political idea that they were opposed to the building of Cop City. So I just want to be clear with that in terms of the people who are now received and or have charges, uh, that their act is an act of thought more than an act of deed in a lot of cases. The act of deed is just showing up. Yeah, thought is being opposed to cop city. So it's very important to distinguish. And I think, again, as spoken about in some of the other comments, um, the idea is to criminalize the attempt at change, the ability to think through that you want something different and then to act upon it, and then to challenge those who have authority 
and decide, no, we're going to keep things the way they are. And your role as a member of society is potentially to vote for who we tell you to vote for, and then to go back and be good consumers, which means we want you in front of your TV or your devices, and we want you to be buying things. And if you do those things, you are doing your service to the greater good of creating capital and capital accumulation. So there's a real battle of thought and ideas. And when people use police, or when police action is used, how it's used and who it's used against and for whose purpose it's used, right? So I mentioned that stuff because, you know, a lot of times people have gotten this recently too. And, I, and again, this is just part of this, this the indictment language about hate, like police hating ideology, right? Um, and or the idea that uh, police solve crime in terms of a positive iteration of what the police do, right? And so my answer to that usually is a conversation about this is not about individual police officers, right? I don't care if they're good to their families. I don't care if they walk their dogs. I don't care if they put their kids through college. This has nothing to do with them as human beings. What it has to do with is that when they're called upon to go into communities and stop people and write tickets and to follow a way of doing that, which leads to people's incarceration, injury, and death, they do that. When they're called upon to go out into the street and stop demonstrations and rallies and protesters to push people back, um, to pave the way for others to roll through, they do that. They don't ask questions. They don't sit there and negotiate with you for any long period of time. They're there to do what they are told to do. So it doesn't matter if they're good people or bad people, because in the end, they're following the directions of others who have a strong political objective behind why they're telling people to do the things that they are doing. So going back to the question I was asked to talk about, um, I think sort of the dilemma of our time, particularly when it comes to organizing and organizing and activism and thinking through things in terms of collectivism, solidarity, it is booting out actual and or perceived bad behavior versus bad people, right? Um, or vis-a-vis -vis bad people, or whether or not good people could have bad behavior. What are the mechanisms and means in which people who say they want not to sort of re-emulate the ideas of the state in terms of punishment, uh, for those who are perceived to be guilty of certain acts. But if there is this idea that we're going to be doing something different than that, right? That we're going to be doing something uh, that brings around solidarity, that uh, allows people to make uh, amends for injury and or allows for another way for things to act. And we're starting in these smaller circles or ideas of our activist community then those are the things that we usually confront on a day-to-day -day basis. And then our conundrum, it, it does become, how do we resolve this? How do we do this? What mechanisms do we set up? What permanent structures and or non-permanent structures do we set up? Uh, do we ostracize and push people out? Do we make ways for folks to give apologies and to keep going? Um, all of that stuff is ongoing work that is happening both in good ways and in terrible ways in movement spaces and in other spaces, of course, but also, of course, in movement spaces. Um, part of the Defend the Forest space and other movement spaces has been around, what do you do around setting up mediations when someone is making an accusation of folks committing actions which they believe are akin to bringing in sort of a white supremacist ideology or hoarding resources or things around uh, sexual violence even, right? What are, to, what are solutions and answers to that? And in some ways, folks set up mediation circles to have those conversations to see whether or not there were ways in which we could 
things could be worked out amongst them and that work can keep on going. Whether or not that meant some people had to be booted out. At one point in the force, two different camps developed who would not talk to each other because they felt the other one was illegitimate in terms of their actions vis-a-vis -vis the struggle around Cop City, right? Uh, and some of that was brought around through personal interactions um, and grievances. And in some ways, there was other grievances that were around. Again, there's resources coming in. Who's deciding how those resources get spent? I should decide, or we collectively should decide, or a, a queer Black woman should decide, or someone else should decide collectively. All of those were things that were kind of discussed, debated, thought about within the ideas of having this collective community. For the most part, the larger struggle, and I don't know if it's a good way to say the larger struggle, but the struggle that brought people into the force remained the predominant motive for folks being there. But it did not mean that out of the folks collectively deciding to live or stay close or work together, that these issues did not find their way in terms of even at some points destabilizing and then healing had to take place. Reconnecting, refinding ways to cooperate on new projects, to build up trust again. And in some ways, some people were removed or asked to leave and not to come back, right? Early on, even outside the forest, there was an early collective of organizers um, that was broken up because a larger collective, I'm trying not to use names right now, um, although I could if you pushed me, um, a larger collective of folks said this was our project and other folks said, no, 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 no. That was not my understanding of our work together. And that, that entire organizational grouping uh, fell apart. But, but people, the whole movement didn't fall apart. People joined other movements and other organizations and kept working. And other movements were asked, or other organizations were asked to take a step back and not be central to this work because of their, their history of, and this is particularly with Black women, of ostracizing Black leadership, not understanding how to work with that leadership and casting racial stereotypes amongst people, whether they knew they were doing it or thought they knew they were doing it or not, right? So those things all came to different discussion points and to be specific, some of those were dealt with through mediation circles. Others of them just when the groups dissipated and groups were asked to step back, they did step back and so the movement continued. But all of that is a work in play as anybody who's done any organizing knows, right? Groups have broken up because of the lack of ability to solve issues that are both political and a lot of times personal, right? Um, and so again, that is just a continual dilemma of a movement which is not well resourced, doesn't have permanent structures. And then the question becomes, should it have permanent structures, i.e., you know, an autonomous zone that's temporary versus something that's permanent, which for some folks, you would if it's permanent, then it sounds more like the state, right? Unless they figure out ways in which to cooperate with each other, right? So all of that is at play in movement, dialogue, and discussion. And we only succeed when we figure out ways to work through it and to keep those movements going and keep those movements prospering. Thanks so much. Um, we definitely need an oral history um, of this. Uh, we have great oral history uh, units here at Columbia. We should be thinking about that. Um, yes, Tiffany. All right, so um, it occurred to me when I was listening to everyone and this idea about solidarity as a criminal act, right? And if you think about it, the government understands solidarity in many instances. Often it's when the government is calling upon you to be patriotic. That is a solidarity that they not only understand, um, that is a solidarity that they will to make those who don't demonstrate patriotism heretics, right? Um, they understand solidarity when it comes to back the blue. So what they are, are alleging top city activists 
believe it's the flip of that. It's the flip side of that, right? The unnecessary nature and violence of policing. But they fully accept, promote, and raise money on the concept of solidarity, of backing the blue. Um, and if we if we accept that, right, if we accept that premise, it's not that collectivism or unity is a bad thing. It's just to them. It's that collectivism and unity that does not serve the purpose of consolidating power um, on the basis of race and class is is uh, collectivism that cannot be tolerated because if we look at the way that it's been wielded up until now, right, it has allowed a, a tremendous amount of harm. And we can see that on a bipartisan basis. So Kamal and I wanted to be very clear that the um, violence enacted on Black, Brown, poor, and queer communities, the criminalization of dissent, um, meaningful dissent, is something that is nonpartisan in this country and in Georgia, we are seeing it because this ball is rolling because of mayors who are heralded as being progressive. One of them was a lawyer, Mayor Dickens is an engineer. They are the beacon of black excellence and they have um, continued the practice that was popularized in Atlanta after the race riot, what we call the Atlanta way, which is Black political elite leadership class, um, partnering with commerce and other governmental actors to ensure that Black people stay in their place, that they are consumers, right? And, and, that, and lawyers are not immune from that or immune to that. The respectability politic that comes with being a Black lawyer in a city like Atlanta suggests that the community with which we should be in solidarity is the Black misleadership class, Black political elites, right? Um, it is the Black de uh, developers, the Black real estate moguls, the Black entertainers. Those are the kinds of Black people, those are the classes and categories that Black lawyers are supposed to or expected to fall in line with that complicates the work of building solidarity outside of our little sphere of movement lawyers. Because to be a movement lawyer, it means that the community chose you. If you call yourself a movement lawyer because you decided that you were and you're not accountable to any organizations, not accountable to a politic, right? You're not accountable when you cause harm then you're not a movement lawyer, right? You are a political actor in the legal landscape. And we have to hold a lot of that at Southern Center because when we, you know, everyone saw Just Mercy, I, I, I think we might've hosted five Just Mercy screenings. And I remember there was one and we had a client who was sentenced to die in the morning. And we had to go to the screening. And I think, you know, our ED was speaking, our, our, our policy director was speaking at this panel, it was sponsored by a white shoe law firm. And um, while watching the movie, all you heard was all of this weeping. And it was our staff, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Weeping because all of this investigation had been done. Everything that could be done, could have been done to save the client's life was done. And he was still going to die in the morning. That is the weight of this work. We didn't have social media campaigns. We didn't have Cadillac asking us to, you know, get a brand deal. The, the work is not the visibility. It's not the visible part. Okay? By the grace of God, that client didn't die in the morning. He was granted reprieve, right? But I, I raise that because there was this irony of being at a in a theater where Michael B. Jordan was playing the role 
a, a prolific lawyer who used to, who started his career at Southern Center. There's all of this glamour and money around that story. And because of Southern Center's work in the community, that respectability is assigned to our organization. That is just a true thing. But the other thing that is true is that we had hundreds of people in a, in a theater with about two dozen who were weeping, right? Because our client was gonna die in the morning. And then the next thing we had to do was wake up in the morning and continue to do the work. And that part requires that we disconnect from the importance of respectability. And that also, that disconnection is imperative for us to sort of instill in the lawyers that we are recruiting to represent protesters. When, 20, when the 2020 uprisings happened and we had like, you know, a couple of hundred arrests in one night, one of our friends who was, uh, was re leading a, an organization tweeted, I'll represent anybody who gets arrested tonight because he was so frustrated with the police. And then he got hundreds of thousands of retweets. <laughs> and <laughs> he started furiously emailing like, what can, I cannot handle this, right? Because that isn't something that people really think about, like the logistics of it all. And I don't think he was feeling self-important, but I do think the response alerted him to just how small we as individual actors are it would have been impossible for him to coordinate any meaningful representation of, of protesters. And we could have said, you shouldn't have done that and, you know, have at it. But instead, <laughs> we had to do some harm reduction, right? And so the, the, the building of solidarity across the legal profession as a fixture in the broader movement community is it is always changing and the dynamic I think changes more and more lately because of the speed with which people get information. Well, you know, when I first started organizing, I, you had to call people, you know, you had to go physically meet in person. If something happened, you could watch the little CCTV from City Hall, but there weren't a ton of ways to get in a lot of information so quickly, but now there is, which creates sort of a, an illusion that we understand everything without even speaking to one another. And so we have to encourage not only like a ideological uh, alignment, we have to actually coordinate people being in physical space and community with one another. So for example, when we kicked off this project, like this most recent inter, uh, iteration of the lawyer support or the protester support project, we did a closed door in-person briefing about Cop City. Half of it was organized and explaining what the movement really was, um, how it conflicted with what Andre Dickens said and what our police chief said and what the governor said. And the other half of it was understanding like the skill sets of lawyers, what they needed to learn to feel comfortable representing people. And we have to do that all the time, all while our supporters are sending little nasty grams. What do they call them? Yeah, nasty grams are little mean emails to our ED, maybe complaining that one of our staff said something that was less than respectable about a politician or about a political actor, right? Because we are not supposed to do that at Southern Center in other people's estimation. And those other people do include lawyers, does include lawyers. Um, I'm grateful that we have leadership that is, um, so Terika, our, Terika Redfield-Gansey, our executive director, she is um, from Mississippi. Her grandmother was one of the first people to register to vote in her town in Mississippi. And she always says, um, I am a descendant of those who decided to stay and fight. And I think that that's what we as Southerners doing this work, especially try to carry. And that means that we don't have to cower behind respectability, despite it being something that people call upon us to do. And it means that we can encourage others to come from up under, you know, the galas and, you know, I don't know, the golf tournaments. And there's nothing wrong with that stuff if it's important to you. 
but it can't govern how you relate to people in the community that you serve. Thanks so much. Yeah, that's so important. It's so important because it is, I mean, that's what's going to be very trying about and 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 the task in representing persons uh, who are charged here, right? It's, it's, it's easy to get behind. It's easy for us to all get behind, you know, the innocent person on death row. But, you know, it's 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 the dif- distinction between maybe certain acts and and the person. Uh, that we need to make. Um, you started on this social on solidarity, right? You you started with solidarity. I mean, I just just so that you get a sense of this, okay? Because I mean, I just don't. I mean, it's hard to it's hard to fathom. But just because you, just so you get a sense of this, this is page twenty six of the indictment. I'm reading from the I'm reading from an indictment. Okay. Social solidarity is another term that is embraced by anarchists that is tied closely to mutual aid and collectivism. Social solidarity is the idea that individuals can live together without government and can provide for each other. The notion of social solidarity relies heavily on the idea of human altruism. This is the indictment. I'm, I'm reading from the indictment. That is altruism. That is individuals will voluntarily offer goods, services, and resources without anything compelling it. Anarchists often short, shorten the term social solidarity simply into the term solidarity, okay. and it is frequently woven into the speeches, statements, and writings of anarchists. In addition to the term solidarity and other anarchist terms, anarchists often weave the terms mutual aid and collective into their jargon and writings. It's stunning. <laughs> Um, okay. Uh, sorry, Andre. Um, I'm just thinking about solidarity now. Um, uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, you didn't realize that rich history. Exactly. I mean, exactly. You did, but I mean, um, it was criminal to think that. Yeah, I know. Exactly. Right. I know. I'll stop the criminal now. ideology. <laughs> um, I guess I'm also, um, quite taken by the question of experience um i think and that i think in part is because of how and i don't say i don't mean to say this in a, any with any sort of connotation but how visible what happened in france in the Zad, but also what's happening in atlanta is and i think it's quite amazing that that people who are not involved in this movement can um, see the name and understand exactly what it's what it's trying to do um i guess what i'm interested in thinking about with those things though is how to extend the experience of that movement beyond its goal right how does that become part and parcel with everyday life because the stop cop city project is the blocking of a, a specific structure right but what that structure aims to do is not so different with what's already occurring in everyday life and people's everyday lives, right? So how how does the experience of what happens in the forest and stop cop city, what happens with um, the different sorts of cooperation occurring there? How does that go beyond the frame of just that movement? How does it, how does that become permanent without that being restricted to a specific time and a specific space? Um, that's why I think that that is an interesting. Uh, way of thinking about this because um, I don't think that the idea of permanence was on the mind of many people when they when they moved there. Um, I think, in fact, I think that would go quite against some of the politics of that movement. Um, uh, but the question I think is, how, how do you create something permanent like that without it, without it having to be you go to a specific place or you wait for something to happen, you wait for an event to happen. And you have that experience. Um, I think it's in uh, there's the Invisible Committee writes quite a bit about the riot, right? and they say you know no one leaves a riot unchanged. Right? It's in the riot, in the smoke of the riot, that everything becomes clear, that friendships become clear, enemies become visible, and truth is the most accessible. Right? But how can you move that experience, that perception? The creation of those sorts of bonds beyond just, and I don't want to be reductive here, but beyond a, just a moment, right? How, how does that become the 
how does that become the norm of everyday life and the different forms of oppression or policing become the exception to the rule, right? Um, and I think it's interesting to think about these things with Hakim Bey because Hakim Bey is really allergic to visibility, right? He's he's the, everything the, the sort of what he's talking about with this autonomous zone is it cannot be legible, right? And I think the power of what happened in France and what's happening in Atlanta is its legibility, right? Um, is its legibility to a broader population. But how does that then translate into something that enacts a, a broader sense of change, right? That isn't just about preserving a force, which is very important, right? But how does that, I guess, uh, sort of ideological underpinnings of that, regardless of the different political visions there, how does that, how does that become permanent? More than just a specific zone becoming permanent. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thanks, thanks. Yeah, definitely. Go ahead, come so, on. And then I'm going to open it up. So, yeah. Signal. Yeah, and then, uh, okay, go ahead. So just really quickly, because I think I, I think that's a really important conversation that a lot of us are already happening, uh, having in Atlanta over Cop City, right? Um, and I, I think I expressed this earlier. One of the things that we see is the greatest outcome about whether or not Cop City gets built or not is the level of unity that's happened amongst different forces all across Atlanta that probably hasn't happened in a very long time in terms of, again, people of different ideological persuasions, different viewpoints as to even why they got involved with the cop city fight. The goal of the organizer, I will say, at this particular stage is to keep the unity going past the particular battle, right? Um, i.e., what are the 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 uh, battles in the future, and what is the larger war to be won? And part of that larger war to be won is the unity of the movements, preserving that and preserving ways in which folks begin to con or folks continue their working relationships. Um, and what are the outcome of those working relationships? Do those working relationships? express themselves because in uh, electoral politics, we move out some of the really bad actors. Does it express itself because even if there's no longer the forest where people live, there's other zones that are being developed in which folks work together and move in and live together? Is it an expression of larger creations of mutual aid? We do mutual aid in my organization, Community Movement Builders. We use sort of a more Black um, uh, historical theme or legacy of calling things uh, liberated zones in terms of instead of autonomous zones, we use the term liberated zones. And then we also talk about having liberation programs as opposed to mutual aid, because it comes more out of the Black liberation struggle as in terms of its terminology. But basically, they're very similar, right? But how do we work together to build up larger ways in which we do that work and through that work politicize people so that they too can see that the state as it is, is failing them, but yet taking resources from them and using their bodies as fodder to preserve the system that be. How do we convince people that that does not need to be their life and the ways in which we address issues and problems in society? Those are all huge, huge, no matter where you're at, right? Huge issues to address. But one thing that we're having in Atlanta that again, during my time period, I'm not from Atlanta, I'm here from Brooklyn. Um, and so that level of unity, um, again, during my short time period that stretches, I have not seen until now. Doesn't mean that we'll stay. There's always reasons for people to fight. But we're at a space where collectively, as Tiffany was describing, we've seen the opposition. And it's not just right-wing Republicans. It is so-called moderate, liberal, black Democrats who are teamed up with these Republicans because what they really believe in together, despite their, uh, their differences and the, the fracturing somewhat of, of a ruling class in the United States in terms of some of the harshness of the fighting back and forth, is cops and capitalism prevail. And that's across the political aisle. And so that is something that I think we have seen more than we've ever seen in terms of this expression of unity. And that is something that hopefully we will use 
to move forward to say what takes place if we don't win the Battle of Cop City, right? How do we keep that unity going for that next battle, that next fight, extending the work that we continue to do and extending the unity that we want to keep happening? Thanks. Thanks so much, Kamal. And thank you all. Um, on this point, uh, we shared on Zoom, for those who are on Zoom, this article that just came out in Hammer and Hope um, by Eva Dickerson, which is a really important piece, I think, precisely on these questions, um, how, the, how the Black misleadership class provides cover to Cop City. So you might be interested in that. We can, we can share it uh, later as well with all of you. Um, okay, so we're going to open up and we're going to start with uh, Nikita and Rikash. Um, so, uh, other people on Zoom. So, we want to make sure that everybody gets to hear your question. So, um, um, so I wanted to ask so, so there is cooperation in the, the temporary autonomy zone. But as far as lawyers are concerned, the cooperism cannot be temporary because the um, because um, any moment of resistance will, I mean, when there is any form of um, institutional back backlash, then there is a there are arrests that happen, there's detentions, there are charges that are filed, et cetera, et cetera. And that's a long process. So how do you ensure that? That cooperism continues while, regardless of the temporality of uh, the resistance person. Sure. So, the reason that we formalize the representation program is because we want to create permanent protester, or um, we, we're just calling it movement infrastructure to protect dissent. And so one thing that we were able to do is um, get money to hire a fellow who would be at Southern Center for two years to um, envision and build the First Amendment Lawyer Bridge project as a fixture at Southern Center. And what that person's responsibilities would include would be not only the logistics of pairing attorneys and making sure that retainers are paid, by our payment processor, um, there's another organization managing money because we don't want to touch it. But um, but also building curricula, curricula for non-lawyer legal support that would be doing research, um, building a database where lawyers can communicate with volunteers or even paid uh, non-lawyer support to draft briefs and other. Uh, other um, documents needed for court. So, you know, some solo practitioners don't have um, paralegals, for example. And then the other part of that person's responsibility uh, would be outreach to the community, especially grassroots organizations who in, would end up needing the services of lawyers who are part of the bridge. We believe that the um, continuing legal education is not only um, something that shores up uh, the legal community's ability to respond to repression, uh, but it also serves as an outreach tool. So if you're able to get your ethics hour or you're, you know, you're able to get your trial advocacy credits by also coming to one of the Bridges um, CLEs, then it also allows you to consider joining the project. So at that, the our goal is exactly to address what you raised, which is Having rapid response be the way that we persistently address this kind of political repression, especially that as, it, as it is experienced in the criminal legal systems, is not sustainable as the state continues to escalate violence. Um, and it's harmful because people can develop expectations that you cannot meet and people will plan protests based on expectations that you cannot meet. It's, it's, you know, we're at a time, we can't expect anything from, uh, we have, we never know from day to day how bad it will be. So we're trying to address that. One smaller Thanks. question. I just wanted to ask that, do you think that the reason why this time they arrested so many people who were not actively organizing, but were more participating, was it uh, because at some level, when you have active organizers who are known within the movement space, 
who are arrested, then there is a larger campaign that can be kind of spearheaded around that arrest. Um, in contrast to when people who are quote unquote non unknown or invisible people are arrested. So this is a weird way to answer that question in a sense of um, I do a lot of public speaking for movement for these, this movement purpose. Um, and so people would keep looking at me and trying to suggest, how come I haven't been arrested yet? <laughs> and I'm like, yo, be calm, calm down. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like to stop, stop with that. But I do think there is a, there's something in what you're saying as in all the folks who were in that, most of the folks who were indicted were folks who were already arrested. There are certain people, though, that because of the different political and racial dynamics of Atlanta, who are being targeted as leadership because they believe they can paint those folks as outcast, where they may not be as able to to paint somebody like me who may rail against them, but may have friends in other places who are also nonprofits, who are lawyers, who are other people who are black, who may offer some sort of resistance wall against something like that. However, anarchists, right, folks who are on the ground who are anarchists don't have that, and particularly in Atlanta. Most of them are white, right? They are, um, they can easily be targeted because um, they're putting forth ideas which these folks from Atlanta can say, oh, that's foreign to us. And or part of the arrest has been that they will look at the IDs when they stop people. If you are from Georgia, they have let you go. If, you're, if your uh, uh, ID is from out of state, then you are arrested and charged with domestic terrorism. Same place, same time, same factual situation, no difference whatsoever, except one ID is local and one ID is out of state. And hence, they can do, they can do what was talked about, which is to say these are outside agitators coming in basically stirring up our locals, right? So the incredible usage of black elected officials who claim to be the, the prodigy of, of a Dr. King using the language of Southern segregationists to justify their arrest of organizers and activists. Mm -hmm. So you have a particular targeting at times of certain groups in this particular, it's, it's not exclusively by any means, but certain groups to paint a particular picture. Um, and that is part of what is happening in terms of some of the folks who've been arrested, not exclusively by any means, but who gets arrested and who gets highlighted in the media a lot of times as the quote unquote troublemakers. So I remember, you know, this is, I remember doing 2020 when there was, uh, let's just say there was um, uh, uprisings and things were being um, um, torn apart. That wasn't an exclusively white thing, all right? And we, our community, and I take this as a source of pride, has a history of rebelling in this country against racial injustice. And so we should never be pushed into a corner of being told that there's only a certain way that we need to react to racial oppression, right? Because when we do that, we allow those who are in control to set the terms of our uh, uh, our ability to fight back against oppression, and we should never allow that. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Um, uh, one one second, Leonard. Let me just. I was going to pass the mic first to uh, um, Rikash, and Rikash. then come back to you. Is that okay? Uh, Go ahead. Thank you, folks, for being here. Uh, it was really educational. My name is Rikash, and I'm one of the students. Um, one of the things that kept coming up for me in your discussion was kind of highlighted in the Taz piece by Hakeem Bey. There's uh, one of the poems is called Crime. And I won't read the whole thing, but part of it says, um, as soon as you begin to act in harmony with nature, the law strangles you. So don't play the, so don't play the blessed liberal middle-class martyr, except the fact that you've that you're a criminal and be prepared to act like one. And it kind of reminds me also of our conversation about uh, civil rights organizers and kind of the mindset that lots of folks we know would go into um, spaces that were segregated and decide, you know, we're gonna break a Jim Crow law. I feel like part of that is kind of taking on this idea that um, if these acts are criminalized, then 
that just makes me a criminal. Um, so yeah, I guess my question is in a world where sitting in trees, truth telling, the right to bear witness and pamphleting are criminalized, does it become necessary for movement organizers, community members, and maybe lawyers to start accepting the fact that they're criminals? Uh, and what does that mean for our understanding of respectability, et cetera? I'm interested in all of your thoughts. Sorry, but you can Who wants decide. to start? Who wants to start? The, the Hakeem Bey reference there, and Andre kind of is, is calling on you, I think. Um, I think that's a good question. Um, I think I think an answer to the question of criminality would also depend um, on what your personal politics are. Um, I think that um, I'd imagine that there are many, say, since we're talking about anarchists often, I'd imagine there are many anarchists who would reject even the idea of criminality because the idea of criminality would suggest that there's the opposite of that, right? And that that exists and that is something that's possible. Um, uh, I certainly understand the gesture Hakim Bey makes with that. It's, uh, you know, to, uh, to cast aside any rule of law, right? And to operate on principles that are not dictated by that. Um, I'd be curious to know about from people who work in the legal world, uh, what they have to think about this, because, um, yeah, I think, I think especially in the context say, of these, uh, these indictments, right? Um, uh, it, it sort of problematizes the strategic efficacy of labeling oneself as a criminal. Right. Right. Mm -hmm. um, and I think a lot of that will depend on the scope of a movement, the lifespan of a movement, um, uh, how much power a movement has vis-a-vis -vis the forces of domination. Right. Mm -hmm. So um, that's a roundabout answer. But, yeah. I would say that. So I have a, my phone lit up because I have a nine-year-old and she doesn't care that I have a job. And uh, we talk a lot about words and language justice. And so criminal is like a word that is not permitted to be used in my house. You know, I say inmate, there are a lot of things we don't say. But I think we can accept that um, we are criminalized, right? And that we can't be preoccupied again with what labels the state assigns to our righteous work. And if that means that we continue to be criminalized, but in, in so being criminalized, we are still advancing the interests of our people, I think it's okay. I mean, I'm okay with that. So, you know, the way that I approach it is probably the way that a lot of folks in this work approach it, which is if it's, if it's a bad law, it was made to be broken. And on the lawyer side of this, it means that if, the, if that is what the clients have decided to do, and, and I wanna talk about, there was the Ray Sharp Brooks Peace Center was the Wendy's that was burned down um, after Ray Sharp Brooks was killed. And it was an autonomous zone. They, that's what they were seeking to do. They brought in violence interrupters. They brought in mental health professionals. They were de de providing food. They had things for the children to do on the side of this Wendy's, right? But it was a hail of gunfire that caused just like the occupation of the forest, it ended with you know 50 plus bullets killing Tortuguita. Um, we had a shootout at that location, which is now um, the cause of some gang prosecutions in in the city, right? And the in the there is this irony of that that was a black controlled space where community members were had armed people protecting that zone because white supremacists were patrolling Atlanta with rifles and pickup trucks. They were blocking off the entrances and exits of parks and the state was nowhere to be found. And so the armed people at the Wendy's were protecting the black people and the others who were there occupying space, trying to heal. Um, and they were criminalized from that occupation. We started getting calls like, I tried to, you know, people were complaining in a way that they did not complain about Occupy, in a way that they did not complain about Tent City. We had a Tent City a couple of years ago um, because it was white college kids. 
and the second and so it kind of it goes that there is no societal fixture that does not infiltrate movement right and and that is that from which movement is like insulated um and they were criminalized from the moment they decided to take the Wendy's for the forest occupation they may have been mocked um they were mocked when they thought that they were going to go in there and leave they didn't think that the occupation would be successful and when they escalated to criminalizing white organizers it was because they saw, I believe, the solidarity between that movement. It was multiracial, multi-ethnic, multi-generational. And that's when it became a threat. Um, I do believe that things become clear, clearer in riots, in, in uprisings. You know, that's, who you, that's how, when you see more, more clearly the danger that you're in, in some respects. But you can't be preoccupied with the danger. You just have to plan for the harm reduction. Really quickly, um, I, I think one answer to it is from a movement person viewpoint is uh, the ideal of criminalization or accepting it really depends on how is there a critical mass of people who won't turn on you when you're labeled a criminal, right? So that has to do with how far the movement is along, right? Um, and so we have times in history where certain acts of so-called breaking laws and crimes have been uh, taken on in mass because there was a critical mass of people behind it. When you lose that critical mass, or well, that critical mass is not there because the propaganda system doesn't allow it to intellectually go beyond, you know, what thinking about what a criminal is, and you lose those those people, then those few who step out there are really in serious danger because there is not a lot of support for them, right? So when we had, you know, 60, 70 civil rights, black power movements, you had political trials where people were targeted and charged with all kinds of things. And a lot of those folks beat those charges because it was a more politicized time where people didn't, uh, 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 jurors even were not accepting the state's version of events. History tells us that the birth of America was done through crimes against the British crown mm -hmm. in particular. I can go back to other crimes, of course, that weren't labeled as crimes, mm -hmm. but things that were labeled as crimes were crimes against the British crown. Nowhere when you read American history, when it talks about the formation of America, does it say criminal acts were created, were done against the British crown. There were acts of rebellion. There were uprisings. There were acts of liberation. There were demonstrations and marches, and they culminated in a revolution against the British, which we are told to uphold every year in solidarity. But at no point is any so-called patriot who fought against the British rule considered a criminal by the victims. Now, the British considered them criminals, but the British lost. So... Again, there's other crimes that we can talk about that were never crimes on the statutes that obviously were committed in terms of even the foundation of this land uh, into what it is now. But in terms of the idea of criminal, a lot of that is around who controls either the language, propaganda, and history of what gets recounted. Yeah. So let me uh, let me just jump in too, because I think it's a great question. And I think Hakeem Bey's passage is really challenging. Um, and before agreeing, let me just say, I mean, if in fact what it is to be a criminal is to have certain ideas, to gauge in civil disobedience, to create a more just world, then I'll take the label, right? But I think that the, the broader point is that when you look at the writings of all of the kind of critical thinkers who have thought so powerfully about these questions, whether it's Angela Davis or um, Arushan Kirschheimer from the Frankfurt School or uh, George Jackson or Du Bois um, in, in Black Reconstruction or Foucault in Discipline and Punish, um, run all the way to the present, mostly abolitionists today, work of Omavi Shakur, who's here with us and others, it becomes clear that 
right? From from top to bottom, the the penal law is a political project, right? And I mean, that's actually that was Foucault's line, uh, the fond en comble, right? From top to bottom, penal law is a political project, which means that it's all about defining certain acts as criminal, as illegal. And that's where all the play is. That's where all the play is. That's where all the political struggle is, is in defining certain acts that are somewhere at the in this borderline space as illegal or legal. Right. And that's what this indictment is doing. Right. It's trying to take it's trying to draw the line in a political way so as to place certain acts into that space of criminality that then triggers the kind of condemnation um, that society bestows on this uh, this notion, this fictitious notion. Right. This fictitious factual notion of what is and is not a crime. That's the whole. That's the whole political struggle. Um, and so, and so, in that sense, right? I mean, then Hakim Bey's uh, statement is a little bit too simplistic, right? Um, but yeah, go ahead. if I could jump in real quick, I think on a semantic level, um, uh, I tend to prefer the word um, fugitivity to criminality. Um, I, you know, I'm thinking a lot about. Uh, Fred Moten, when I use that kind of word, but to a uh, kind of idea of escaping the, even the notion of criminality being, a, uh, and I think you can connect that to some broader history about the Haitian Revolution and Maroons and escaped peoples. Um, but something that that evades the the very, I guess the this penal penal structure. All right, so we've got time for two more questions. Uh, one from Leonard Post. Sorry, we just, we're just going to take the one from Leonard Post and one from Decca Hussein Wetzel. Um, and Leonard Post, a uh, renowned criminal defense attorney, also mitigation expert in death penalty cases. You, got, you want to jump in? Yeah, just quickly. I'll be real quick. So criminal defense will risk destroying the solidarity, right? In, unless... So, so let's say 60% of the indictments are open to First Amendment challenges. And in five years, they'll be successful challenges. That leaves the 40%. That, that, that reduces the number uh, 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 and that takes away their protection. Mm -hmm. how, how, are you, how are you gonna do that? How are you gonna deal with that? Let's take the second question, and then I think what we'll do is we'll wrap up. We'll have responses that address the question, but also give some final thoughts. Go ahead, Decca. Okay. Um, so we touched on this a little bit earlier, like super briefly, and I really wanted to ask, have there been oral history interviews done with those directly involved with protesting Cop City? Um, and then you know, are there any specific stories that have stood out to you that you could share with us that encapsulates the reason um, you do what you do around the protest work? So I know that's a loaded question. You guys can think about that because that's why you have Great. the other questions to answer Great. first. Thank you so much. Okay, so let's, um, We can, I think we can address both of those as we weave in our final comments. Sure. You want to start, Tiffany? Uh, so um, uh, the... Uh, People are already fighting over criminal defense within this little ecosystem. It's happening, it's happening over who's informant, it's, it's wild. And so what we've tried to do is start um, creating the model that like segments people's, um, seg segments some of the conversations. And then we do have a team of lawyers who want to do civil litigation over the legality of the domestic terrorism statute and some other stuff. Um, but the the easy, the the, Short answer is people are fighting and we are just trying to not even mediate. We're trying to say, you all disagree. And we, even though you disagree, everybody is entitled to a defense and we, you all don't have to talk to each other. You can just talk to us. We'll make sure that people have the training um, 
that they need, but it, it hasn't been easy with this number of arrests and this number of, of open cases. And then the other question was about um, stories, narratives. I don't know about stories. I know that there is, so I wrote an article in 2021 in essence, it's called A Collapse of Criminal Legal Reform in the Black Mecca. And it um, it does describe in some part the how we got here through Black progressive politics. Mm -hmm. um, and then Michael Hurston uh, has an article called A Primer, a, a Primer on Crop City, which is very long, but it is very thorough. And I don't, I don't know that it includes uh, narrative, but um, there's got to be. I mean, uh, I, if, if there's going to be an anthology, a book coming out in maybe a year that's going to include um, interviews with organizers and activists uh, who've been involved in Cop City. There's also a podcast called Millennials Are Killing Capitalism. And they've done at least three to four episodes. I know I've been on at least two or three of them where they've had, we've had conversations about uh, uh, the strategies and tactics and plans by actual organizers from Cop City and, and even talking through some disagreements around different politics and stuff like that. So millennials are killing capitalism. Um, democracy Now, there've been several, it, I mean, I guess you just have to, Democracy Now, there's been several disparate, I just want to use disparate because we're both lawyers and stuff like that, uh, places where um, you can find some of those things, but those are some of the things that I know concretely. I guess. Great, great, great. So Andre, that leaves you and you're going to have the last word and um, I'm going to ask you to, to, to end your last word, like not where you started your presentation, uh, but more like where you ended it. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, I guess I would probably be uh, probably be a bit redundant, but I think you know, I think what compels me the most about thinking about what's happening in Atlanta, what's hap what's what's happening in France, what's happening in Turkey, what's happening in all these places is um, uh, this idea of imagination. I think T Tiffany brought this up, right? But that this is a marriage between um, between action and and imagination. It's about trying things that don't work, right? And then trying more things that don't work, um, and then eventually finding something that does work, and then adding that to something that that does work, and and building that continuous. And I think that's one of the more. I, I think Atlanta is very exciting for that, especially here in the U.S., where I think some of these this type of movement does not have the same. Um, it certainly has a long history, but also is not so uh, I think openly accepted politically by by many folks across the country um and so i think i i think the what compel yeah what compels me the most there is what it makes me think beyond them right what it makes me imagine things differently what it, it, in the same way that your book is about imagining ways of of cooperating um in a, in a practical sense um i think that's what um yeah i think is that's what's so amazing about about both of these movements Thank you, uh, Andre. Thank you, Tiffany. Thank you, Tamal. Thank you all for being here. Thanks for a uh, magnificent, important, moving, and inspiring way to start our study this year. So I'm really deeply grateful for you being here with us. Uh, we'll get together in two weeks. Uh, we'll be meeting with uh, Rahel Yegi uh, from Berlin, a brilliant critical theorist from Berlin. Saskia Sassen, uh, who's our own uh, brilliant thinker here at Columbia. And um, Kendall Thomas, our extraordinary uh, colleague in the law school to think more about cooperation. So uh, I'll see you in two weeks. It'll be at the Maison Francaise and um, looking forward to it. Thanks for being here. All right. Thank you.